Salve a tutti anche da YouTube Channel. <ride> e, siamo qui alla Dante Righieri Society del Western Australia e grazie per essere venuti. E grazie soprattutto al professor Moleta che oggi ci farà vedere delle cose bellissime. E, si parlerà della cappella degli Scrovegni e in particolare dei, di Giotto. E, quindi è un onore per noi avere il professor Moleta e soprattutto... È un onore per noi avere voi qua, che siete abbastanza numerosi, sempre, ogni ultimo venerdì del mese, per queste nostre serate culturali, eh, che sapete avremo fino a fine dicembre, eh, quando il professor Moreta finisce la sua presentazione, poi vi dirò quali saranno i prossimi appuntamenti, che non si terranno qua, 24 settembre e il 29 ottobre, ma si terranno alla UWA. Eh, e dopo vi dico di che cosa si tratta. Eh, quindi grazie ancora per essere qua e grazie a lei. Signore e signori, buonasera. Buonasera. I want to go down um, a track that I've been down a few times before in the sense that uh, I love this work. And <coughs> we'll start. <coughs> this is not Scrovegni Chapel. This is a grand early Gothic French cathedral which was built about a hundred years before. He can I, am I clear to all of you? Yes. <coughs> Uh, before the, uh, and this is a characteristic Italian Romanesque chapel, small, squat, hardly any windows. There are a few windows. This is the chapel. The window, only windows in the building are this one, three-quarter of the west wall, and these long, slim windows on the south side. No other windows. That means the walls are made of being painted, painted on. This is why there are so many churches of this style which are painted on because you put all that space faster. Uh, now this chapel was built between 1300, 1301, and 1303. <coughs> this building the immobile building was built in two years and the painting was done in the next two years. And one of the reasons is because it had to keep up with the dates of the Annunciation. Because the chapel, chapel from the beginning, the first, when the, when the main body of the building went up, provisional um, the consecration to the Virgin Annunciate, the, the, the Madonna Annunciate, there was a previously on this land, I'll come back to that for a moment, there was a small pilgrim chapel, small, went back to the 11th century. That was um, dedicated to the same event. And when the painting was done, a grand consecration to who? Hmm. That's important because uh, well, we'll come to a few things. Uh, am I still? I'm not used to this, so. Uh, uh, ah. This is the interior seen from the west wall. It looks up to the altar. The dimensions of this building are very compact. The length of the nave is 21.5 meters, 21.5. The width is 8.5 only, and the height is 12.8. Very compact. That is when you're the, the optimum place for looking at these paintings, given their size, is eight or nine paces away from the wall. That's roughly in the middle of the nave. This is why the tourists should really stay down there. Hmm? 
They do. They found all sorts of ways of trying to keep the place clean and all that. And now this is the view, of course, from the eastern end, looking to the west wall. Right to the ceiling, the curved ceiling. Now you can see that there are three layers of fresco on both sides. This work here, we're getting more than that. I'm only interested in the narrative fresco. These are uh, single figures that are representing the vices and the, and the, uh, and the virtues, actually, as well. But that's, that's later work. All I'm interested in tonight is the actual narrative cycle of the life of Christ and what goes with it. So, the cycle begins here. There's one missing there because it's short. It starts off at the top of the building on the south wall the south wall. The narrative goes down there, it crosses the west wall, hopefully ignoring the, the prospect of uh, the last, last things and hell. But you can ignore that as you cross over here. Then you come to the north wall at the west end, and this story continues up there till you come to the Altec area again, the north east wall. At that point, the story comes down one level to the middle row, this corner, and it goes down to the west corner, across to the middle row on the north wall and back. And it comes down again. We've got some scenes now you recognize possibly. Yeah. So the, the subject for much of it is the life of Christ. The life of Christ proper starts here, which is the, the visit of the Magi to the, uh, to the birth of Christ. This is one, there's one missing here, that's where the birth of Christ takes place. And you, and you see it into segments, this life is broken into its historical segments. This is the life of Christ as an infant. Then you, that one, then you cross over, and this is then the beginning of the public life, the baptism of Christ and so on, until the entry into Jerusalem. Then you come back here, and you see the beginning of the Passion. This is the last, or well, this is the washing of the feet. And the Passion goes on and on, until the crucifixion, and then the events afterwards, the lamentation, uh, the lamentation, the resurrection, the uh, ascension, and it, it ends at the next one. Technically, it ends. Can we go back to the beginning, please, John. Well, the, the top row. Uh, the top row. So this story begins up here, and it's the story of Christ's maternal grandparents. Grandparents. He had grandparents. I don't know about them. Now the grandfather was called Giacomo, Giacomo, Joachim, and the grandmother was Anna, Anna and Joachim. And they're historical figures, but they belong to an, a time when the historians were inventing a lot of things about, on the Gospels and so on. And we've forgotten about them, but they were alive to serious people. And their story was uh, re recalled again in a very, very important publication by a learned Dominican. Uh, the book was called 
the legend Aurea, the golden legend. And it's uh, Voragine. Thank you. Voragine. And this story fascinated artists and other people because it's full of attractive and largely invented details. But this story of the, the Christ's grandparents was a very striking and fresh um, story. You can see what, what the job does with it. Can I just go back for a minute and talk about where the, the, um, the money for the, for the chapel and uh, who put the money up? His name was Enrico Scrovegno. Scrovegno. His father was a famous money lender, notorious money lender. And the son was a money lender too. They used to call them bankers. <laughs> and, uh, and his father had the great honor of being put deep in hell by Dante. <laughs> and he is a proud Paduan money lender. He finds himself in the company of a wretched bunch of Florentine. In fact, this, this, his rag, the father's uh, fame or infamy as a, as a, a money member has lasted in some places. In fact, it was known nationally. I've got an old Neapolitan friend, a very cultivated gentleman. I mentioned this and he said, you know, Vincenzo, when I was young, for us, a, a money lender or a miser, we call it a scrovegno in the mm -hmm. uh, Neapolitan. Uno scrovegno. <laughs> Uno scrovegno. <laughs> I was not knowing quite what it was. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he wanted. So he wanted to please the. He was a little bit of a misfit because he was not like very much. He was a bit insecure, I'd say. He had this opportunity to make a gift to the commune of this chapel. He bought some land on the site of the arena, the old Roman exercising sports. So it's in the pretty well on the northern eastern side of, of this town. He bought land. He spent quite a lot of money buying it from a wealthy family. And he began work straight away, cleared the site. Clearing the site, he destroyed that little oratory I mentioned before, got in the way. And uh, he, he called the best people that he could. So he knew for a good painter, the best painter who was now the rising star was Giotto, who was born in 1267 and who was only in his late 30s. And already he was considered the finest painter in Italy already. So the work began and they had a deadline to, to build the structure. They did it in two years as I mentioned. And then the painters started straight away. And immediately it was finished, they had two years, they had to get it ready for that plan for that that was a dedication again. Dedication consecration. So they blasted straight away Plastered, and then they started working on the on the scaffolding. That's another matter how they actually did it. But they worked on cantilevered platforms. And there were holes in the in the in the masonry for the builders in the first place. They had these platforms on these cantilevers across there. And builders work from bottom up. They plant, they lay bricks from the bottom. The masters and painters work from the top down. They must do that for hygiene and their personal hygiene because you're working up there. <coughs> you can't work down up because the farther you go, farther you go, the, the more danger you have of having your plaster and stuff drop down on woodwork. So it's the other way around. And that means they're working at the beginning 10 meters off the, off the uh, ground level. So it was risky. So we'll start with, I'll just say what I think I can. Uh, we have the first scene. 
This scene is called the expulsion of Joachim from the temple. He's the one with the halo. The priests, they wear phylacteries, but they don't have heroes. There's a very strong anti-Semitic thread in this cycle. And it comes out the way, very often, about the way he depicts the, the, Jew, the Jewish priests uh, that come out of it. Just imagine, for a painter to take up a theme which had only been uh, publicized about four or so years before. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, it's a long time since I've done this. <laughs> and uh, to begin with that absolutely intriguing, unusual, fascinating view, Doctor's great fame lies in his solution for perspective to suggest depth on the flat surface and the way he found hardly looking at the new wave of sculpture with the deep, in, deep cutting in the shadows to suggest the solidity of the bodies. They're quite convincing and when they go together like this one feeds off the other. They could be standing here but their solidity is enhanced by all this wonderful, wonderful receding drawing here and there. You know he's there because he's, he's got this around him. You, you, uh, you know that there are these other structures here because they're hinted at only. There's no surrounding internal walls here. It's, it's abstract in that sense. It's not important. This is what is important. This is the altar with the Holy of Holies, the, the tablets of Moses. And yet over it is almost a Christian kind of symbolium, as if it were over the Blessed Sacrament. And there's the cell a, a, a pulpit at the Jews don't preach from pulpits, apparently, somebody will correct me. So it's it's somehow producing a Jewish subject which won't be too hard on the eyes for the poor Christian viewers. Anyway, he is he is banished or expelled because he and his wife have been childless for a long time. And for the, the Jews to be childless is uh, kind of don't mark against you. It's called somewhere unhappy with you or something like this. Anyway, he is expelled because uh, apparently parents who are childless, he's probably impotent or he's mutilated. May not be. Okay, yes, it doesn't matter. He then apparently was known and he tried to give an offering to the temple and they say, he was kicked out for that reason. He went up to the temple three times a year, 100 kilometers from one foot from where he lived. He was known in his own village as a good man. I don't believe, I don't believe the, uh, his impotence or the barren condition was a reason at all. He's carrying a little runt of a lamb here to offer to the temple, but it's been re re rejected because it's not good enough. Yeah. That's, that's just mm, that's just another idea on this. Mm. That's not uh, that's not uh, conventional, mm. but because um, he is a farmer with a sheep, the uh, proper sheep, he should bring a whole sheep. <laughs> mm. So we start there, and being heartbroken and ashamed. He goes back not to his wife, but he goes to the place where he has his sheep. And we've just seen a scene where the solidity and the humanity of the figures is, in, is enforced by the drawn background. Here we've got one of the magical outdoor scenes that enhances their humanity. He goes there because he knows his shepherds won't bother him, he can just he can just cry to himself and feel sorry for himself. Well, yeah, a bit strong. But his sheep know him and they come out. He's not even acknowledging the attention of his dog. He's just completely locked away. 
you know, where they've come out. This is simply the space where they've come out. It's just a patch of black and it's there, all empty. And the heads are uh, lined up with the plateau of this great, massive, menacing piece of stone. These, these such decent boys, you can tell they're laboring boys and poor boys because their garments don't go right down to their ankles. They always leave a little bit of bare leg. I'm just worried I'm not speaking loudly. Enough. Oh, good, thank you. Uh, fine. But they seem to be having some, at least visual, contact with one another. You can imagine just what this one is saying, or what they're wanting to say or thinking. I say these painters think, paintings think, because all of that is in that wonderful, wonderful questing of the troubled, uncertain look. We'll go on. In the meantime, the mother of this, the wife of this man, Anna, <laughs> has visitation from an angel, an angel, an annunciation to her that she is going to have a baby girl, and they'll call her Miriam. Miriam. This is their house. <laughs> this is their house. This uh, removal of the front wall allows you to enter the house. This, when when they all the all the front is off and there are a number of them, you're not watching it. You're in there. Hmm? You're in there. And so. All of this is touchable stuff. This is a wonderful um, drawing because A, you see it, the very first it developed uh, example of a receding interior, starting with the furniture, back, back, bed, covering, bed covering. Then you've got a wooden frame up here, or a frame up here for the for the curtain and so on. And uh, the only little, the only place was a small window for the angel to put his head in. It was a little squeeze, I think. But she hears the message. She was praying, and she has an answer. And in the meantime, she has um, a servant girl who's out here carding some uh, thread. She is not privy to this. She's not locked away, but she's just her compartment adds strongly to the overall solidity of the building and yet she is a kind of silent witness to it. And these, and these creatures, like the shepherds and these servant girls, are not in any texts. There's no text at all that ever mentions these ones. And the, the whole cycle is full of anonymous creatures. Mm. And the, the, the boys and the girls are always benign presences. They're there, like those two shepherds, benign. And there are, there's another group of lookers on like this, who are a malign presence. And these are the Jewish priests. Mm -hmm. Jewish priests. They're just there on the corner, mm -hmm. yeah, setting it up, or showing some kind of uh, dissatisfaction or, or scandal. So, you can see possibly how, how this is articulated. There is a sloping outside ladder up there. This is a clear place you could stand on. So this is the Annunciation. He's away, moping away. He knows nothing of this. Nothing of this. And so from now on, for the next three scenes, there will be the pathos of his ignorance. He doesn't know. And she has no way of telling him. They're a long way away from one another. And uh, this is this is our Joachim. He's he's moping away. This this must be another part of the farm because there's a different stone background, but it has a similar feature. 
with the background. Look at these handsome boys with their legs showing. This is this is a sign that they can't they're poor. Oh, it's there. You can pick the rich ones and the poor ones, and the poor ones are always, always much more happy, much more likely. Well, you know what they're doing? They're minding their own business. They're there to help if they do, and they don't fall behind your back, and so on. He has a dream in there. It must be that either if they've got two of these identical cases uh, for the sheep to go, or they shifted one. Put it back here. Now this is this by this it's the same place, but the landscape isn't. So it's one of those, and he can play with this as he wants. But the light is falling in this direction, and you can see the light and shape. I find that it, that it's taking all this light here, and these shepherds uh, are pretty sharp. They hear good noises, they hear noises and noise, they're wonderful noises, so they sense there's something in the air looking up. And he is being told by the angel that his wife is pregnant. She doesn't know that he knows. They only know that they know. <laughs> this this crack in the stone is good for them hiding the sheep from animals and so on, other animals. But I think this is, there are several pictures where you've got a mix of animals here and the painters had a lot of fun. It's good fun for them to animate all this rock and all this solemn stuff with these animals. Because these animals, you know, sheep and uh, and rams are not usually put together. Yeah, they're all together. They're happy with one another. Hmm? Ram, sheep, black sheep. Yeah, happy together. Good place. And now we come to the last scene in this first row of six scenes on the top of the three layers on the south wall. And um, they were both told in their separate secret messages that they should go to Jerusalem. She will be waiting for you, the angel tells Joachim waiting for you at the Golden Gate. They're not going to uh, be shy about kissing one another heavily in public, are they? <laughs> Here they are. The two people, if you start to look at this and you see they've almost become one, even their halo is one and a half. And this is his eye, and that's her eye. That's one pair of eyes. They, they share these these features of their faces. You can think of some you know, hundred year old Picasso and so on doing exactly the same thing. Here it's being done. There's one nose there. Those two noses have become one nose. She's pulling his head in uh, with her hand. Am I skewing the. <coughs> She's pulling his head in. <coughs> She's pressing her mouth against his beard. He's holding her with slight reserve, but still it's very strong. And it has an audience. There are five women here, one in black, and the others are young maidens uh, who are really enjoying it. They think it's wonderful that they can be so unabashed to show their love for in, in public. These are well-bred girls, they put their hair up. Only naughty girls wear their hair down in the Middle Ages. <laughs> yes. These are well-bred girls and their hair is up. This one, this lady here, is a widow. A recent widow because she's in her weeds. In her weeds. She's flowering. She's so great for her. Here we are. These people are having the pleasure of being affectionate in public and look at me. Sarbrates. Interesting painting. And then you've got this magnificent, substantial fortification as the background. 
all this strong, intimate emotion against a kind of military background, there is shows it all. And you can see how very often on the base there is a rocky, you know, a line of rocks here, broken up. Sometimes, if you see later on, there's a path, for example, when the flight into Egypt takes place, when the whole of the edge is rounded in shape, broken like this, dangerous. That's not there yet, but it just shows that this is civilization and this isn't. Hmm? In a much sort of way. Now, we've come down to the last of the scenes on the row one, on the south wall, the crossover against the last judgment, and we're now on the north wall going back. So the next scene, just imagine how those two, they're, they're not acknowledged. Can you go back for a moment? Uh, they're, they're, they're acknowledged and it's interviewed for your this is one of his, one of them has come up, can't see if there's another one, one of his shepherds, lots of legs showing. He's seeing his, his master in another life. But when you, when you look hardly at feet of Jericho, he's in bare feet, he's in bare feet. He's ashamed that he that he was so constant, so so particularly engrossed all that time. He's come back, walked back with his bare feet, and attention. Now this, the first scene, is the birth of the Virgin Mary. The house is the same. The house is the same. They've moved away the furniture. The the curtain has been swung around to give her privacy as his mother on this side. And here we have a classic Eastern Orthodox, ancient, second, third century, these images were appearing on their icons of a birth based on how people had babies in the open, public births. Now, you recognize the same uh, pain over, the, over the, the bed and so on. But it's all that, what are all these people doing? She, there are, she's either giving back or receiving her child. There's her child wrapped in its birth, first swaddling cloth, which the mother has put on. Where did you get that cloth from? From this girl outside who's giving a roll of bottling cloth to her to pass down. You have to uh, imagine that all these things can be happy, happening together, and they can, actually. There's a story here that can be reconstructed. Hmm? So the way I've seen it, and I may be mistaking it, that she is, is because in this um, classical Greek Orthodox image of birth, of birth of these the Virgin Mary and so on, is to have, first of all, the mother is wrapped him up roughly. The, the baby is passed back to these midwives who are kneeling near, but not, you know, not against the, the bed. And this one is taking off the initial swaddling cloth, the baby is washed in a basin mm -hmm. to remove all the, the gluey stuff. Mm -hmm. And this one is unrolling her swaddling cloth so that when the child goes back, you'll be comfortable. Now that's weird, and that, that, is, that is a classical, that would be very happy, you know, in Greek art. It's the same combination. However, this is very uh, domestic. These, are, these women are her friends that come to give her moral support. Uh, so, the baby's come down here, the baby has been cleaned up, sent back by the same, and here, 
Do you think that those, I'm not sure whether those two arms indicate receiving her as a child or giving it away, giving it? If she's receiving it, then the baby's come back the other way. By the way, the baby has moved, yes. moved to and fro. And these women are these good, <coughs> uh, simple, hard-working folk who carry all the good qualities. Yes, look at that. Picking the, the mucus out of the eye, that's one of the features. That was my head. Just, can you see over my head? Good. I'm on this side. Thank you. That's better. Now, when the Jewish girl is weaned, stops, is, is weaned, and she's about three then, then she uh, entered the school for young ladies in the temple. So here she is being a good kosher girl, being picked up by her mother, being accepted by the high priest, this one, and it's a happy day for them. There is the father, this is a priest too, he's just, just there. He's got, this is the person carrying the suitcase. But here are two of those nameless Jewish priests. This one's talking to this one. He's, he's signaling. He's signaling out children. Four years earlier, they will remember what happened. How has he rehabilitated himself? Has he rehabilitated himself? Don't you remember? This is something that darkens their day. It's there to indicate that there's some tension there which <coughs> they're probably not aware of. And now you can see the very first picture gave you, without any background, that interior which is at the uh, on the eastern northern side. And you saw that pulpit in the distance, nothing to back it up. Now he, the painter takes the opportunity of filling that out from the other side. It doesn't need walls, you, you wouldn't see inside. So, no walls, you see everything. And so you've got the other side, and it's all four down, um, filled out now. You've got a ladder up here to the pulpit, all that wonderful drawing, all the dark spaces underneath, the uh, laying depth, and here too. This is a way of suggesting the other side, the external side of the of the, uh, of the temple. Now, the um, there is a section which I cut down rather strongly because it we go from the birth of Mary, the education of Mary, then there are two or three scenes which are all exactly the same and they treat of the wooing of the Virgin. There's a little altar there and all the, all the contenders for the girl, men on this side and she's got her mates with her. It all falls to pieces until Joseph by mistake hands the rod in which if it flowers would be the one. And he <laughs> He, uh, it's strange because when you think of it, they meet up. He, he didn't enter the first time when they were asking for the men. He didn't, he indicated that he was embarrassed being seen, uh, even looking at a young girl. So finally he's hooked up with a girl who's too young for him. And she meets and marries a man she doesn't know. It's grand. Anyway. This, this, this <coughs> restores your confidence in painter's way. And he's not a painter on his own, is he? He's got a team of five or six up there, and they're all, that's the workshop. <coughs> they all share it. 
they when they lay down the crust in the first place is the layer before the top layer from which the master draws the shapes, the outlines of the of the buildings or the figures. Yeah. And the, the top layer is of the crust is so fine that it just comes through like the it's a guide book. But the master normally pastes that paint stone. Mm -hmm. And it's generally understood that the job to paint it all the faces, all the flesh pits, faces and the hands. Uh, we're halfway. We're halfway. Gosh. So, after the marriage, she was walked by these two young priests who are guiding her. <coughs> First she goes home and then she goes off to, to her husband's house. Was it an arranged marriage? What's that? Was it an arranged marriage, was it? Not quite arranged, but he got her a rat on the He had the rod. He had the rod, which sprayed and had a bird come out. There's all these other, and all these in the side of that picture, you see all these grumpy men, younger than him, looking very stern. <laughs> he had to. She had to. So you have this This is the most serene painting in the whole cycle. After all that disturbance, you have this virgin queen in her own space. There are her admiring and loving girls behind her who were around her when she married. You've got these two priests. And then wondrous of all, out of nowhere, they meet some buskers. They meet some buskers who are there just to play them home. Play them home. This one's got a, a, wind, a, a, a string instrument with a very long bow. He's still sort of laying with a pipe or something. And that is, is a welcome art brush from where they're probably going. You can see how splendid they are. There's someone on the left about showing their cars. I love these characters. They're the most, they're the most unselfconscious of all. Now, this is the altar area, the apse of one of those grand Byzantine cathedral mm -hmm. uh, churches in Sicily. They've got all the, the, the Byzantine style and the, and the imagery and so on. But it was very strong in Sicily right through to you know, over the 1000s and the numbers. This church is called the... Um, Monreale. 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 I'm sorry, my short memory is not good. I'm just saying, Montreal, and I've been there so often. It's only eight or nine kilometers north or south of Palermo, and it's a hundred meters long, and it's all covered in gold and mosaic, <coughs> and uh, all the gospel signs and so on. This I show you because, first of all, <coughs> this is the classical Greek image of the God Almighty, Omnipotente. Pantocrato, the, the powerful over all. And you can see that because he's got his right fingers in the gesture of his power and blessing. And this was the gesture of the ancient Greek teachers when they were teaching, walking up and down. This is what he was. So we'll see him, Christ, in most of the cycle, you'll see him in right profile, and he'll have his hand up like this. Mm -hmm. okay. And then under him you will have this is the, the heaven with two of some other four these angels straight erect. She holds her child and no saints. We go to the next picture. Now this is the uh, this is the equivalent in the scrolling chapel. Mm -hmm. We're looking down the altar. And above the altar, <coughs> you have the, the Lord in Majesty, and He has. I should go back to you, you know. These, the, oh, these angels also always sound very stiffly. When we come to doctors, crowd of angels, they break the ranks. They're so excited by the news. So excited by the news. I wonder if it's the news. The 
Angelus may ask to send a particular message and not make a question of a woman. How are you up to it? You want to be the mother of God. How can that be? I trust you. And that this will love them, the angels go mad for them. Breaking it up, yeah. laughing, turning one another, one way and another. That's, and that, we're ahead of ourselves from a lot of you, but this, you see, go back again, I'm sorry, there's just something here. No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. There's, um, The angel of Abel is there, the Lord is washing up. It goes over the arch into the other half of the house. It's the same house divided in two. Washing, all matching. The angel's, angel's message goes over the arch, and presumably the answer goes over the arch. This figure is painted on a panel of wood. Mm -hmm. Last long with bust mm -hmm. fresco. Now, this is the visitation. Mm -hmm. When the, the angel speaks to the virgin and she agrees, he says to her, Your cousin Elizabeth is six months pregnant. She is only a day pregnant. However, you go and see her because she like your company. And this is on the side of the West Wall, actually. And this is just under the Virgin side of the Annunciation. This is her cousin. This is the Virgin. Her fetus is in Coed, two days old. This one is six months pregnant. These are those beautiful women we remember know the names of, who are sympathetic, watchful, careful, smiling. And what do they see? Six months old fetus recognizes who the inchoate one day fetus is. And that fetus gives her an almighty kick. Now some art historians, which I'm not, they say you can tell her all she she's bent over. This is the kick, which is he paints the kick. Marvelous. Yeah, and it, he has to have them in profile, otherwise you won't see it. You won't see it like that. Yes. I meant to do it. <laughs> yeah. uh, and this, this is a little bit of an <coughs> architectural uh, addition, simply to give a background. We, that's not recognizable. To, uh, we can't approach, uh, attach that to any, any church or anything. It's just giving some little um, the darkness of that with the space so that they're not standing out on their own. That's one of the most celebrated paintings in the house of uh, also. Yes, can we go back to the uh, to the part of the piece one? Oh, there. Now there are four of these. Some of you may have seen them in Western Tuscany. There are four of these majestic carved pulpits which were carved by a father and son, surnamed Pisano, because that's where they're from. Nicola, the father, and Giovanni, the son. And between 1260 and 1310, between them, they, they, they built four of these pulpits, four meters or so high. And around the pulpit proper, depending on whether they're five-sided or eight-sided, you have five or eight of these panels which are covered with, or uncovered with, deep, deep cut episodes for the life of Christ. They're up there. And they're a long way up, so you can not always follow them easily. And then there's all this decoration in the round. They're marvelous. Great, great things. There's one in the baptistry in Pisa, there's one in the cathedral in Pisa, there's one in Siena Cathedral, and there's one in a beautiful little church in the city of Pistoia, San Andrea in Pistoia, and that's considered to be, and I think it's the most beautiful of them. But there's, 
that were all this shape and size and style. When uh, his father put his signature, they used to write their signature on the bottom and said, I made it, and someone gets the date. And he notes there that his son, 13-year-old boy, is an apprentice. And the boy, Giovanni, really finally overtook his father. Never mind. He's a and the beauty of these works in Western Tuscany, the artists Giovanni and Giotto uh, were good friends. There's a in the in the church, uh, the chapel, <coughs> on the high, on the main altar. There's a statue of the Virgin by Giovanni. He he obviously was in the Now this is one of those panels from one of those pulpits. This you can imagine is about a um, uh, meter and a half long and about a meter high. And this is a full-on baptism, uh, birth of Christ, which has all those elements which are pro uh, Greek elements really. You've got, first of all, you've got the, first of all, there is the angel speaking to her, telling her of the Annunciation. Here she's just had the baby, she's just had the baby, and there it is, lying in the manger, in its first swaddling, 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 swaddling cough, until she's handled down to the, the midwives. And the angels are being told, and they're coming down the side, and here are their sheep. Normally, there is an ox and an ass behind. Sometimes they're in a cave, and they have their mouth, chins on the mat, on their little bassinet, and they're breathing on it to keep it warm. You see that again on all these images. Just it's very similar. Very. You, this one, however, is tragic, isn't it? Just what people can do. This one. This is the child. Who's, this is the baby who's lost his head. Vandals the leg. So it's, this midwife has taken the the the, the mucky, uh, mucky cloth off, and this one is pouring the water in. And very often you see if she's got a free hand, she'll put her hand up and she's, she's checking to see that the water's the right temperature. And now we come finally to poor old Sir St. Joseph. He doesn't he wonder what the heck's going on. He hasn't had anything to do with this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, there he is. Normally he just switches off. He's asleep. Yes. He's asleep. <laughs> you tell me when you want something, darling, but this is you at the meantime. <laughs> Now, this is, this is after the baptism of Christ, 30 days after birth, the woman goes to the temple to be purified, charming. And eight days after a boy is born, he's brought to the temple, and his foreskin is taken off, and then he is, he is dedicated to the All of that is in this one scene, this is called the the presentation of the baby Christ to the temple. And you may recognize this shape. Where did you see that shape before? Indeed, it's the temple. This is a cut down temple. It's the same place, same place, just minus the enclosure, the same altar. And here's his mother, here's his father holding the lamp, the pigeons, two of them which are offered as a give to the temple, and now she's got to give her moral support as uh, one of those girls, the lovely uh, anonymous girls. And here is a lay, these two, these two lay, elderly lay people, seers, prophets. There's no Jewish priest in, in the, inside. They've got the temple to themselves. They go there all the time, but not when the priests are there. He's holding this lady here. And and they stay he they both acknowledge that this is the time we've been waiting for. This is the Messiah. And the lovely thing is that he I there's something special happening here. He's swinging away, he wants to be with his mother. 
I think it's very good in the, in the, in the yes. Now we come to the event that follows the massacre of the innocents. It's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. Evidence in a sense. You've got, you've got the soldiers on that side, two or three parasites to him, to iron part and I to get involved. Here are all the weeping women over their children. You've got mm -hmm. two or three very obvious examples of the brutality of the Roman soldiers. If you look at this part of Massacre Vegas, each one has a face you can see. It's as if they have a foster individuality, individuality, despite what all these faces show up. And then you've got two buildings which represent the two bodies of what we know. This is Herod, King Herod from his balcony giving the board. That's the Roman power. And this, over these good women, is a contemporary baptistry. Mm. Kind of going up all over and all over here, just then, especially in Tuscany. Mm. And so this, in a sense, is their hope of some relief, the strength of their faith. Now, this is, as you know, as you can imagine, what is called Christ teaching in the temple. Well, first of all, we notice this marvelous evocation of a back room in the temple. Muslims, you know, the Muslims have all got, generally they've got a courtyard behind them, not as they have here. And that's where they do the teaching. This is the equivalent. This is some kind of adjunct to the temple where the teaching is done. Well, he's not doing the teaching on the grave, on the day. But when he was 12, he went up for the first time to Jerusalem with his parents. When a boy was 12 or 13, he was just the right age for the father to introduce him to the temple in, uh, in of, as a matter of course. But he gets lost. He gets lost, his parents get very upset. Mm -hmm. Several days later they find him. Here they come in, Joseph and Mary. She is berating him. You don't know how much we've worried over you. Why did you do it all this? And he says to them, Why have you why are you so upset? I haven't I told you that I must be about my father's and my, I, I must be about my father's business. The temple is his father's business. What he says to these Jewish priests is, I am the son of God. His father, I must be in my father's house. Now, that's the crucial exchange on the, on the whole painting. Most of these paintings have a helping point of emotion or drama. That's that's it there. He's got his hand I'm sorry. He's got his he's got his hand up in the in the in the and these the, this is the phalanx of face, it's all in line. This is the high priest who's pretty gone. These are all very upset, rightly so. This one's got a head like so curious about the intruders. Right around. So, all these eyes and faces speak volumes. So it's not really the teaching in the temple. It's, uh, it could be a short title or something like that. I, I let them know that I acknowledged I was the Son of God. And that's what, that was the beginning of the end point. Oh. The marriage of Cana. The whole of the front is off. This is a, the, the, the dining room for the wedding. Don't worry about it. That just means you're in there. Right? I don't want to re repeat this, but that's, that's what the, the effect of is all of these technical ways of suggesting death. It's on the wall. It's on the, the band there and the walls. 
It's up there in the gallery, it's in the shadow. They've got enough depth dictated by the table. His mother says, can't you see they have no wine? Almost chiding him. He says something like, don't worry, or leave that to me, something like that. But it doesn't say it here because they're too far away to hear the scripture. Anyway, there she is, noting it. And here he is giving instructions with, with what hand? Right hand? <laughs> to this girl. She passes it on to the boys here who are filling the, filling the uh, containers with water. And here is the maid for the testing it and seeing that it's as red as a container that he's got to put dark red wine on so. Mm. so this is this is the marvelous point in this painting. Marvelous. Quite funny. I mean he's overfed. Yes. Over he's been no wonder the wine is running short. <laughs> this is um, this this miracle happened a few days after Christ was baptized. It was very, very soon. This is his first public appearance and his first miracle. And the next scene is the great miracle of his life, yeah. towards the very close to the end of his life, just before the Easter, which is the resuscitation of his very dear friend. Two of the women at Bethany, the two, the Mary and the Martha. I think it's Mary Magdalene and the Red. And they are, what are they doing? In the, in the Byzantine early court um, religion, the, the custom for people to come into the presence of the emperor is to prostrate full on the ground. And so this is a Greek gesture brought into the Eastern Western painting. There they are. It's called a proskinesis in Greece. That is a uh, and you'll see it elsewhere. There they are on full Greek Byzantine piece. We come to the entry to Jerusalem. This isn't doctors at all, as you can see. This is a uh, late uh, 12th century mosaic in the royal palace, the royal uh, chapel in the cathedral at Palermo. I'm showing you this just to, just to uh, give you an idea of how things can stay, stay the same and how they change. So this is all the disciples are behind it. This is Peter with the white hair and the boys are taking their clothes off and screwing the, the palms. I think there's a bit of a joke here. The donkey's born and put his foot on St. Peter's foot. <laughs> so they, they can have jokes, you know, so long as nobody gets them. <laughs> <laughs> and now you see the doctor's wonderful rendering of this famous scene. Entry into Jerusalem. How dramatic is this? Formal now, the boys are up breaking off. You see them before they go on the ground. 
The children are taking their clothes off, getting tangled in them. And Christ is in his proper kingly posture. Right profile. And his disciples. This is from the public life. This is the bear kicking all the traders out of the uh, of the temple, cleaning the temple of the traders. The back is an invention. This is a kind of imagined facade of the whole of the temple. So we have to see only a facade in the whole cycle. And that's the background out of which all of this comes. So this facade is now empty virtually in every way. And Christ is doing the business in full view. Three of the Gospels don't mention that he has a whip. In John's Gospel he mentions that he found a piece of rope on the ground. This is the one that Dr. Church uses. He's got his arm raised in violent ang in anger. It's, it's, coming, it's coming out of his hand here. And uh, these are two of the traders being driven away. But you can see all this. He's made a great mess here. He's got all this broken furniture behind him. He's tipped up the table over the top of it, completely up. These, these, these cages are obviously empty. But look at some of these things, how refined they are. Look, there's almost invisible birds, possibly. Mm. And this one has got wire getting in it, too. This is when Judas takes the bride. The bride. <laughs> takes the bride to uh, Well, the deal is already done. There are, of the four Gospels, only uh, three of them say that he approached the, the high priest or the priests and they didn't tell he, they didn't tell him what they would give him and they said they would give him. Well I think it's Matthew says that he received the money and he was they they weren't told when they were going to be paid the others. So this is from that gospel and he's got the money in his hand, it's quite plump there. And the priest is in the in the process of shooting and working out with no you mercenary. He's being pushed away. I don't want anything you do get away. The angel is here trying to encourage him not to do it. You just carry on there, just carry on. Just what you do just what you're doing and keep on doing. And here are two priests. What are they doing there? <coughs> they are commenting on what's going on. They're saying something. Does that priest know what the, the, the rascal is dealing with? Mm. It just adds colour to it. And they're in their own little architectural city. The Last Supper. Mm. The Last Supper. These black halos are gold halos that have been uh, oxidising. So but this, this doesn't mean much as any other of the scenes has its point of pressure. They are, they've got the halos on the back of their heads when they're back to you, because otherwise the halo would completely obliterate the face. So at least they can show some expression. But what in this corner he wants us to look at is the moment when Judas meets the hand of Christ over the over the dish. Mm -hmm. Joshua leaves enough space between this character, Judas, and one of the apostles for you to see that. Mm -hmm. He said, one of you will betray me. Mm -hmm. Will be. He hasn't betrayed me. He knew he was betrayed. The point is he knew he had been, been, been betrayed already. He asks this question, they can't answer because none of them will. He doesn't ask is any of he doesn't ask any of you whether you have. So they have no answer to give to that question because they, none of them will. It's a kind of irony when he knows it's happened. And then he asks his when will he return? Sublime irony. Yes. 
is the middle one on the last row on the, south, on the north wall. This is the famous Judas kiss or non-kiss. Judas is the one wearing the medieval color of treachery, yellow. And this is the center of the central fresco in that row. So you can't look at anything else. You've got the goodies on this side and you've got the, the priests with their fanatical yeah. hands and the Roman soldiers. And it's set in, in late at night, but it actually happened in the late afternoon. Never mind, it's much more dramatic now. Some of these uplifted spears and torches appear in later Italian painting, but this is the source. One by Francesco. And um, well, let's see, is this? Uh, they, when you read all these accounts in the Gospel, the like all the Gospels, he says a little, or he says nothing. <clears throat> Here he says nothing at all. Mm -hmm. It's Judas who's lifting his head and puckering up for his chest. Christ looks at him silently. He's taken off to Caiaphas, who's the high priest, which at night sort of shut it in. Secret. Secret. There he is. Now, for the first time, we see him full face, agonizing, desolate. Who could help me? Will anybody? He's about to be slapped on the face by this Roman soldier. Or perhaps he's a, a temple soldier. Anyway, he's, he's so busy showing how shocked he is. And this is the four conscious pilot. It's got various names. The uh, tormenting of Christ and so on. Uh, the Latin phrase for this is ecce homo, behold the man, which is what Pilate said when having knocked him about, he brought him out onto the balcony and he wanted to pacify the Jew at least to, uh, to have it seen that he punished him enough. So he's got, he's come up He's got these Jewish priests, which are no, uh, no gospel. And here, Pilate is talking to the high priest. The high priest's angry fingers open. His, his Roman, his moral, open, quiet Roman uh, face is pointing to him and saying, look at him. Um, aren't, you, aren't you satisfied with that? Do I have to do any more? And they're enjoying it so much, these young fellows, pulling his beard and, and this black soldier. If you follow the trajectory of this broad little animal, you can see. And what a touch to put that black hand on that. Striking. Crucifixion. Crucifixion. On the right side of the crucifixion you have his followers and on the other side you normally have the soldiers, normally. There is a legend that when Adam died, a son of his put a seed in his mouth and that seed grew into the true cross. It was out of that tree that the cross was made. And on this side, You've got a motley group of Romans and others, but it's, if you look at them closely, they're showing already their remorse already. This one is, this is um, the soldier of Longinus, who's pierced his side. Here you've got the three of them who, who cut up his cloth. They're the This one wants to cut it up, cut it again. He's being restrained by the others. And here, it was a, it was a seamless, seamless garment. When you, neck must be the hardest place not to put a seam in. There it's seamless. That's, that's uh, a century before Tokyo was painting. This is a, a lamentation in a, in a monastery in Yugoslavia. Just to show you, that was already existing before Doctor had his wonderful lamentation. This is a lamentation not mentioned in the Gospels. 
in the right direction from left to right. <coughs> right to left to right. And you walk. All these, these are the weeping women, the women from Bethany. These creatures are anonymous in the field. They're all tragic when you don't see their face. And who's this here at the end, straightening his feet with a red dress? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. She's always after his feet. You saw it in the um, mm-hmm. crucifixion. She's obviously. So she's caressing his feet, the feet that not long before she anointed. And this is the mother. This is the mother embracing her son and kissing his son as just as he, as, as, as he did. Yeah. In the same way as when he was born. Exactly the same. And this is St. John, who is now her son, the way, her adopted son. She's adopted mother. And this wonderful street of stone not only protects them all, gives them some cover in their grief, but it's the, it's the slope that allows its exaggerated grief to be carried down to this center. This is a resurrection, not a resurrection. Mm-hmm. You won't touch me. As you got up early, the others haven't seen it. This other, this, the re- resurrection is often depicted, normally depicted, there's the three Marys who went. This is the other version, very rarely replacing it. So, that's enough to suggest that who was empty, just put in a strip of dark brown, and you put in enough for the angels to sit on my company. The sleeping shoulder of the soldiers are completely oblivious. And what's happening here? He calls him Master, and he calls her Mary. She wants to touch his feet. Mm-hmm. Look, one of the feet with the nails, mm-hmm. and he's saying, "Do not touch me." That's what it is in English. No one meant angel. I think what it means is, you don't have to touch me, Mary, to know I'm alive. Ah, oh, well, we're at the end now. That's something to cheer you up when you're leaving. That's why it's there, because that's when you can look it up and look it up as you're going on. There's a lot going on here. Help. These are the souls that are arriving. These are the blessed. These are all the formal present inhabitants, the angels and the apostles. But here's the something quite interesting. This is a line of people who are cramping up purgatory. And can you get any secret people on this one? Um, no, sorry. That's a word. Here is one who's got a hat on. Can't see it. He's got a plasterer's cap on. That's taken to be job. With his plasterer's hat on. And there you've got Scrovegni with somebody else, a cleric of some kind, who's offering the chapel to the Virgin. They're holding it in their own hands, it can't be very heavy. And this friar was shown now, that he was a kind of theological advisor to John. There it is. This is Scrovegni. He's got a light collar on it there. The weight is lying on, on the shoulder, on the shoulder of the fire. He was in a convent just uh, joining the uh, chapel. He was a well-known, learned man. There's the Virgin with two companions. He liked to touch her feet. <coughs> she's welcoming him.
Any questions? <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Thank you for <clears throat> such a great presentation. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just interested, did Chopto have any direct influence of like, Jewish sacraments? Like Were you known, like, or, or witnessed any like, uh, Jewish temples? Uh, or that was it really like, uh, oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. During the very time, you know, there were lots of Jewish money in this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. They were much more popular than me. And then there's all that gospel reading and Bible reading that goes into this. Was Kruvenio Jewish? I don't know. I really don't know. Is there some of Jewish name for you? No. Uno <laughs> <laughs> were the Jewish the bankers at that time? Oh, they were. They called it banking. It's money lending. That's what bankers do, don't they? They lend money to interest. But these were privateers, or the bankers are privateers. Yes. It was the wide They had capital. They lent money. They made capital. This is not a question, but a, a comment rather than a question. Yeah. Um, I noticed you said, I think you said that uh, Jokto was born in 1267. And it's curious because Dante was born in 1265. That's right. And that's and, and, uh, yeah, they were, they were almost the same yes. year. Right. And uh, Dante died in 1331. When did uh, Jokto die? He died, um, I think, in 37. 36. In the 30s. They're supposed to have had a man, uh, the, the, the story, well, the, the tradition that they met. He met, Dante met Dr. when he was painting in school in, in the chapel. I don't know. There's not much written in for this. Mm -hmm. Dr. was on the move then, of course. He was in exile. Mm -hmm. And by 13... Well, see, I don't know what you see. The chapel was built, you know, decorated between 1301 and 1305. I don't know where, how far he was up the peninsula in exile in 1305. But he was writing other things as well. It may, you can't say really. Uh, I asked myself how much influence um, Jocko's paintings had on the poetry in ways mm. he's arranged to hell and yes. paradise yes. and purgatory. And well, certainly when you look at that, that hell there, mm. the suicides are hanging. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. So, yeah. <coughs> so a lot of that was commonplace. You know, the Western War was the place where you put the last, last judgment scene. Other Jews had it, even earlier than that. Thank you. Do you think that there are themes of redemption or rehabilitation on the uh, stories there, the redemption of Joachim, the raising of Lazarus, and the raising of Christ? Yes. Uh, is that to reflect that uh, the money lending sponsors of that project? themselves being rehabilitated by... Well, it's not clear how much um, hands growing he had in the choice, the choice mm -hmm. of the subject matter. He had this learned pride um, who... Uh, there has been some work done on that. that they, he was alive and apparently he was seconded from his community, which was just a stone's throw away sharp enough job to his use of the Gospels and so on. Mm. <coughs> One of the things about the mm. It's interesting to note that this story is being done in three circuits of the building. Yes. And the creation in the Cathedral of Montreal are just astonishing, mm. equally in three circuits. Yeah. Is that a convention by any chance of any other yes, examples? Yes, they all go down on the left and the right. Mm. Right. Yes. Okay. yes, it is. And we're creating the spiral. Mm. But it's, it's, it's because the dimensions are small, it's so evident you can take it all in. 
There's one very odd, for example, in the middle there's a huge cathedral. You, you can't really see the space of the floor. It's big. In Montreal, they being uh, partly all the mosaics in Montreal were made by the imperial mosaicist in Constantinople. They had very strong connections. And the titles of all the scenes are in Greek. Yes. So, yeah. And so, we were hungry of culture, now we are sated and full, but if you're hungry now, <laughs> we get our mighty buffet, Italian buffet now, and so we are first, first sorry, I have to tell you something. See the painting there? There is, uh, we have the painter here, <laughs> actually he's um, quite famous, and thanks. Actually, for your beautiful painting of, uh, uh, I think this is a, this is a comedia painting, no? isn't it? What is uh, about Inferno? Yes. It's about Inferno, I can see that. Mm. And so, so uh, she's Quereshi Zarina, if you know that. So this is uh, actually is, uh, Dante Alighieri. This is Dante Alighieri, an international prize. Gary, and uh, thanks for coming, and thanks for listening. So now you are all welcome to our buffet, and thanks a lot. Remember, the 24th of September, we are at UWA with Professor uh, Barbero, Alessandro Barbero, and uh, the 29th of October, we are uh, at the UWA with Professor Luca Somi. So uh, please book on uh, even right through our website to facebook uh, because i think we have limited seats with less than two, uh, 150 probably so and there are already many requests so please uh, so i think next week yes we're going to put on even bright both events, so you can, you are welcome to book, okay, and uh, hope to see you soon at the UWA. Enjoy the meal. Thank you.